Yeah, I've done a, quite a bit of Zander fishing over the last 20 years. Uh, I did it intensely for 10 years, but not so much recently. In fact, I've not caught Zander for over a year now. I've been a bit busy eel fishing, but... So, I started my Zander fishing off on the fens. This is at uh, where the middle level drain splits with Popham's over three holes. And I absolutely love the fens. The, the skyscape and uh, the open space, it uh, means a lot to me. It's not just about catching the fish. I, I like camping out in the wilds. What I discovered was that just before dusk, it would be darker under the bridge than it was away from the bridge. The shadows would, um, it would be gloomy slightly before everywhere else. And we found, just as the sun was setting, if I cast under the bridge, it would catch five or six Xander in five or six casts, one after the other. And in my mind, I decided I found a hot spot for Xander, where they congregated just before dark, and I, I could catch them to order. What I hadn't realised was that the bigger Xander don't generally hang around the bridges, and it's more of a pike spot. So I caught over 50 Zander, and that was probably about the biggest that I'm holding up there. They were all schoolies. And uh, we got piked out, because um, the bridge would attract shoals of silverfish, and uh, the pike would home in on them. And the last straw was when I caught one in the middle of the night and I thought I'd uh, got a massive zander, not expecting to catch pike in the dark, and uh, I caught this one, gone midnight, and um, started to think of fishing under bridges as more of a pike pursuit than a zander pursuit. Um, I got sick of catching schooly zander and big pike, so I decided to move on away from bridges see if we could find anything in the open open water. How big were them nuisance pike? Pardon? How big were them nuisance pike? Eighteens those were. We used to catch eighteens and nineteens all the time around three holes. I never had a twenty but I've had dozens of seventeens, eighteens, nineteens. Um, they seem to have gone nowadays a bit and it's twenty years ago and there was a lot of them then. <coughs> so I decided to move away from bridges and seek out <coughs> new spots. If you look at the far bank, what I'm looking for on the fence, I'm looking for bits where the bank is sheer because it means you've got a deeper margin right underneath that generally carries on underwater, the sheer bank. I'm also looking for bits where the bank slipped and you've got a great big piece of banking in dropped into the margins and that creates a feature for the Zander to ambush fish from. What I found was that the best ones are where you walk along miles of banking, especially in winter when there's no undergrowth and you can see how steep it is. <coughs> and I've found some incredible hot spots from doing that just by bank walking and looking at the contours and um, that's been largely where my success has come from. Um, after that, about 50 Zander that first year, I finally caught my first double. And uh, probably one of the most memorable fish I've ever caught. That was one of the best fish I've ever caught. Not the biggest, but uh, the first double you never forget. And that's more memorable than all the fish I've caught since. Um, by the end of 96, I'd had 100 Zander, and I was still catching them in winter, as you can see. It's, um, the mist has got on all the reeds here and then frozen. It was about minus five, and I think I caught six or seven Zander that day. And um, Zander don't generally like cold water, but when you've found a hot spot and you're right on top of them, you can still pick them up. And the other thing I found, when it gets really cold, the pike come out. 
another 18 pound pipe from the middle level, didn't catch a zander that day. I caught another two pike, both over 14 pound, and that's what we found. Um, when we didn't catch any zander and it was cold, we'd generally catch two or three big pike. I guess the zander just get out of the way when the pike are on the move. So here they are dismantling the bridge at three holes. It must have been about 96 when they did that. And um, again, my eyes are just going to these banks and looking for hot spots. It's just what I do. Trees are always a good one. Um, where the tree hangs over, the, the sands are like the shade underneath. And you could, there used to be some good trees on the middle level, but unfortunately, one year they came and took every single one of them down. <laughs> and all those hot spots have gone. So, funny thing, but these hot spots that I found by looking at the at the banking and swim hopping till I caught Xander, I suddenly realised I was in a bream hot spot every single time. Now, there's a lot of stuff said about Xander and bream. I've heard it said that um, the bream root in the bottom and colour the water up and the Xander like the coloured water so they move in. I personally I've watched shoals of bream on the fen drains and the zander swim with them. They don't follow them, they swim with them. Also, some of the small farm ponds that I eel fish, when I'm catching me silverfish in summer, fishing shallow, and the roach are basking, and I look and I see perch mixed in with them, just like you see zander mixed in with bream. And I think it's, they're all of the same size. And the zander, for some reason, will swim with bream that are about the same size as them. And um, the point, anyway, if you find bream bubbles on a zander water, there will be big zander there every time. So it's the fact that nearly all my zander hotspots have been bream hotspots as well. Um, 20 years ago, I knew the top bream angler down the fens, and he told me all his secret bream spots. And I went round them all and caught massive sander for them all. So it kind of does work. I have to put a few rigs on, because I always get asked about rigs. That, after trying a lot of rigs, I've fished with single hooks, treble hooks, double hooks, the lot. And, um, I always keep coming back to this rig. This is what I would use every time for my zander fishing. Um, these VB double hooks are particularly good. I found those particularly good for zander. And um, I like them to be able to pick the bait up without feeling any resistance, which you get with this semi bolt rig. So they pick it up, they feel nothing, you cut them a bit of slack, they move off, and I've set that stop knot about one or two feet away. So they move between one and two feet, it kicks in and tricks them. And um, it stops them deep hooking themselves, allegedly, but st the old one still gets it down. And um, because I'm an eel angler, I've put this upper trace in, which is off the John Sidley rig. But um, it's not strictly necessary. Um, you could just have a boom tube there and take out the upper trace and have it straight onto the wire trace. But um, old habits die hard, so I, I sort of have a hybrid rig between the semi bolt and the JS rig there. That has undoubtedly been my best rig. Now, with the live bait rig, that's a total bolt rig. Um, when a zander grabs a live, they're having it. 
and they, they do hook themselves and, and pull against that rig and hook themselves and I'll fish that tight straight off the bait rubber these days. Um, <coughs> a lot of people tell me they don't think Zander are finicky feeders and they're always pike anglers that fish for Zander with big live baits. Um, Mark Barrett style I call it. And um, if they were to fish like I do with small dead bait sections in the early mornings, they'll find they get a lot of very finicky feeding. But with a live bait and a big live bait, they, uh, they just don't mind the resistance. The off-bottom dead bait catches more than the on-bottom dead bait are found, so I like to pop it up a bit. And um, straightforward off-bottom dead bait rig, just with a single hook. And um, nowadays I will actually use tiny bits of fish on the hook rather than a whole bait. Um, for years now I've started using fillets of fish and strips and flappers like you would in the sea, like you have a flapper and mackerel. And I find that a better bait than using a whole bait. And when I did use whole baits for dead baits, I always cut the head off across the gills so they'd be pumping out more blood. And when you do that with a dead bait, it will rise up off the bottom because the weight of the head is keeping its head nailed down. You cut the weight of the head off and it will just rise up so it's standing up off the bottom with blood pumping out where the head was. And it, it does seem to attract more fish. A lot of arguments among Xander anglers about which type of rod to use. There's two factions. Um, some people like a floppy rod and some like a stiff rod. Um, I use a floppy rod that will go in a full hoop like that and I love it. I let the rods play the fish as though it's an um, elasticated pole or something. The, the rod uh, does the work for me. But anglers that use stiffer rods tell me that I'm not setting the hooks right. And if I had a stiffer rod and I set the hooks deeper, that then the Zander wouldn't be shaking them out when it gets near the net. I've not found this to be the case myself. And I started using soft rods because one time I lost seven fish on the run. I got them to the net, just about to net them, and they shook their heads and threw the hook. So that was when I started on the, the softer rod. And I haven't actually lost as many Zanders since. Of, uh, so I'm a soft rod fanatic, not the stiffer rod. I also found that if I started to hair rig with, uh, when I was using a treble, instead of putting one of the prongs of the treble into the bait, I found my hooking rate went up and I lost less fish. I found it was hooking them much better. So I started using one of these tagging guns with a plastic tag. The first lot of tags I bought were about three or four inches long and they were too long and I was cursing them because I lost so many fish, missed so many runs. But when I've used the shorter tag, I found it absolutely perfect. Now, with that not being impeded by the bait at all, it drags along behind the fish, and I think it actually hooks them as they're taking it in, never mind as you strike. And the hook seems to go in better. So I've not lost as many fish since I've been hair rigging the bait. Oh, I've only put a few pike in because you're a pike club. <laughs> <laughs> this was my lad when he was nine, his first ever pike from the cut-off channel, 16 pounds. My mate Graham was with us and his PB was 14 something, so my lad was giving him grief all night. What's your biggest pack? I've had a 16. So I had to put him in his place, so <clears throat> as it was getting light, I caught one 1914, nearly 20. 
and uh, that'll shut me up. <laughs> but not for long, because once the sun rose, we moved to the middle level, because I'm not into catching pike, I was after Zander. So we, we went chasing some Zander. The lad cast in, got his second ever pike, another 60. Unbelievable. At this point, I'd abandon him. He's <laughs> only nine, yeah. Yeah. Now, I caught that fish a year later in exactly the same spot, and it weighed exactly the same weight. So it was just living there and sustaining its own weight. An un unmistakable fish. When I caught it, I recognised it straight away as the fish that my lad has caught. So we called it 260's Jakey for a bit. And then the little swine catching his first Sandra, that was an eight. But um, for, unfortunately they live down in Cornwall now, my lads, so they don't get out fishing with me on the fens anymore. Because I like seeing what he caught, it was fun. Yeah. That's the old Xander van to which um, I became famous on the fens. Um, I didn't name it. My pal over there, Pete Drabble, named it. We were we got stuck in a flood, and we were stuck for three days on the relief channel, waiting for the water to go down so we could get the van back out. While we we're there, he, he, he's a graffiti artist, Pete, isn't he? Wrote on the back Xander van. Well, when I got home. I wiped it off, and my lads and all their mates wrote on the back again, Zander van. Every time I wiped it off, they wrote on the dirty van. So I went, ended up going down the shop, buying some silver letters and sticking them on the back. Stopped them writing on it, and that is how I became known as the Zander van. Middle level, awesome place. Totally featureless, so people tell me, but I know a bit better than me. As we said, I'll be walking along here, looking for steep banks, drop banks, overhanging trees, and bream bubbles. Um, when it's calm, if you walk it, just it's getting light in the morning, you'll spot bream bubbles, and that's uh, a good time to do some fish spotting. Were they very mobile, all these green shoals, Barry? No, they're always in the same spots. There's certain hot spots where they hang out, yeah. yeah. Um, whether they move and come back, I don't know. But the green hot spots that I know um, are still the same now that they were 20 years ago. The green are still in the same hot spots. So it's worth, uh, worth getting to know them. That net is full of silverfish, and we've got one, two, three, four, and lying down there's a fifth rod with a, a live bait on, dropped right in the margins next to the keep net. Didn't have a run all night on five rods. Um, decided to move swim, brought the keep net in, all the fish were dead. A Xander killed him through the net. When a Xander gets hold of his, a fish, it stabs its fangs into the fish. If you measure between its front teeth, you can tell the size of that Xander. And these were bloody massive. Must have, must have been that 19 that had out. But uh, without a word of a lie, it got hold of the fish, threw the netting, crushed them and killed them, but never dragged the net in, and nor had it taken the bait on any of those rods, and they had a live bait in right next to the net. It begs belief, really, that stuff like that happens in fishing. Now then, here's the best tip I'm going to give you. It's a fish on the middle level. If you study those photos, you'll realise that I'm casting right across the far side. The middle level runs from 
north to south in a straight line. So the sun rises on the far bank, rises in the east, and casts a shadow along the far bank. So it, when you're night fishing and the fish are spread out across the drain in the dark, you've got less chance of them coming across your bait because they're, they're covering a lot of acreage. As the sun rises and casts this shadow, all the Xander go on a feeding spree. Xander feed first thing in the morning. Um, I've never missed an early morning Xander fishing. I'm up before it's light. I've had, I've had about three cups of tea by the time it's getting light and my rods are all positioned and I've sat on top of them and I always catch at that time of day. That's, um, that's when Xander feed. Now, if you consider that they're all going heavily on the feed and they're going to head for the dark area where all the bait fish happen to be congregating as well, then you realise that your bait's going to be right amongst the Xander. And as the sun gets higher and higher, that strip gets narrower. And you've got to do some very difficult <coughs> casting till I'm actually landing it in water that's only a couple of foot deep, right at the top of the shelf, almost under the rushes on the far bank. And I'm not just catching Xander, I'm catching oh, a, a pike just under 20 pounds, one door, right from two foot of water. So it's hell of a hot spot on these places. How deep is it in the deepest part of the America? Um, about 12 and a half foot, 13, yeah. But. Um, at night, I would fish my, my baits near, margin, middle of the drain, and bottom of the far shelf. But um, this time of day, every single rod, boom, straight over the far side. And the catches I've had are absolutely phenomenal at that today. And uh, it makes me laugh when I see other Xander anglers down the bank. And, um, they get up about 11 o'clock, so oh, it was every night. And they missed all, all the dawn feeding period, which is the time. I started to become a bit disillusioned with Xander <coughs> because I'm not into catching, uh, doing repeat captures at all. Which is why um, I do a lot of the eel fishing that I do. Um, I like catching uh, unknown fish and avoiding repeat captures. And after I'd been fishing the fens for several years, I looked back through, well, it was when digital photos came out, I started to cotton on to the fact that I was getting repeat captures. I had swims, I had a swim that I called the 8 swim, I had the 10 swim, and the 11 swim. I just wish I'd had an 18 swim, but it's never happened. And every time I went to the 8 swim, I caught 8. Same on the ten swim. So I didn't realise that I was catching the same fish, which was quite disillusioning for me. So, at the time, I didn't realise it, but um, so this photo will come up later in the slideshow. Uh, something to do with its fin there, but we'll get to that. So, um, I think I had about eight 10 pounders from the 10 swim. I haven't checked to see if they're all the same fish, <laughs> but it, it does bother me now, I look back. Um, I discovered some of them, I'd, I'd catch the fish, I'd go home, come back a week later, go and fish the same swim and catch the same fish again. And, uh, well, I didn't know that at the time, but I've, I've found out since by studying the photographs. Another, that's another repeat capture from the Thames swim. This is a rare photograph of me fishing up at Denver. I've only fished there twice. The first time we ended up on um, television, 
they'd come to interview the environment agency and ended up interviewing me and I was on the uh, local TV in the, down the fence 20 years ago. They called me Zanderman. And the environment agency offices are there. That's why I don't fish up this end up. Their spokesman from the environment agency came down to do the tour and caught me fishing with three rods. You could only use two in those days. He wanted to nick me. And the, the film crew talked him out of it. <laughs> they were on my side. So, um, so I've not fished up there since till this time. Anyway, this time we were up there, straight on the other bank, all these Eastern Europeans came down, spinning. Caught a pike about eight pound, dragged it up the bank and stomped on its head right in front of it to kill it. Then he, he caught another two and he left them on the bank to die. He didn't even knock them on the head, he just left them and went off to get his mates. And here there's about a dozen of them. So, I thought, I know what's going to happen, they're going to catch a Zander now, and then I'm going to kick off. And these were, were big lads, a lot younger than me, so I, thought, I know, I'll phone Ashley. So I phoned the uh, secretary of King's Lynn. He says to me, Barry, if you want to do anything about it, we're all behind you. <laughs> <laughs> But it wasn't going to come down. Yeah, it wasn't going to come down because it's unpleasable. Right? It really is. <coughs> and I must have seen. Well, I, I won't go up there now. I won't go near Denver. I, I can't watch that lot dragging up fish and treating them like that, and uh, and keep quiet. So so me and my mate had to move, for, or it was going to could end up in war. So it's, it's not very good what's happening down there. Right, here's one of my featureless bits of the relief channel. I know dozens of people have been passed here in a boat with a fish finder. And then they send me an email and tell me where all the fish are and where they aren't. And they always say there's none here. And it's featureless. Well it ain't. I've been all up this before they invented these smart casts and I just cast out with a lead and what I'm feeling for is rocks and what I've found up here I have caught more Xander over 14 pound out of the relief channel than anyone and they've all come all bar one have come from the same swim and I've found it myself and it is bedrock. There's no silt, it's hard rock. And Xander, like rocks, so do zebra mussels. And Xander love rocks covered in zebra mussels. So I've been going up and down here for years, casting out till I feel a hard bottom. You can tell if your lead lands on a hard bottom or silt when you're experienced. And I, I can drop it down and feel rocks and then I'll set my bivvy up there and build up a picture of that swim. As I mentioned I use a lot of rods and some so I do search a lot of water when I'm out there. Uh, on there my method would be to look for the base rock. Now there's even the old bed of the Great Ouse crosses this river in part and that, that's got a lot of base rock in it as well. And there's a lot of silica sand and gravel around here. Now, when they open the sluice gates, that all moves. And it washes it in from the banks here. They come and put reinforcements up to stop the banks from collapsing, but where they haven't put them, the sand and the gravel slipped in and then the bank drops in. So, with being so loose and movable, when they have a big runoff on this river, it scours the bed out down the middle, right down to your base rock. And that's why I keep going on about rock. And that's, that's been 
Paramount's my success on the relief channel has been finding rocks. That was my first biggie back in 95. Um, not the best of photos, it was only on my own and we didn't have digitals in them days. And I put the insert there because I caught that casting straight over rocks covered in zebra mussels. You find uh, one of the mussels stuck on the prong of a treble. If you keep raking it over the spot, and you'll, you'll know you're in the right area. So, I think I've, I must have spent a week looking for that swim. And I found the rock and caught that. And ever since then, I've had another five 14s from that swim. Interestingly enough, not repeat captures either. Oh, bar one. So, that's my old mate Alfie, he's, he's dead a few years back now. Um, he was a bailiff on the relief channel. And um, his hobby was looking after Xander anglers that lived in Bivvies. So I called him Dad. And he woke, he, can, he was at my bivvy every day before it got light, because he knew when I caught. And he'd stand there and watch me catch every day. The good thing was that he was the bailiff and he was also had to enforce the laws. So there he is, bringing me live baits. <laughs> <laughs> Many of them wanted. We got on great, me and Alfred. And the other person who you always come across on the Relief Channel is Stevie Younger. Now, if you can get him to do your slideshow on Sunday, he knows more than me by a mile. Um, I look up to this fella. Some of the best tips I've got from Xander fishing have come from his books. So it's um, it's worth reading a book like that, even if you only learn three things, it could be the most crucial things you're going to come across. Um, so I'm jumping about a bit, we're down the other end of the relief channel now. And I found myself a hotspot, all under my own gumption. But it's quite obvious when you look. That sign says "Beware gas pipe," and the gas pipe runs under the drain from one side to the other along the bottom. It's laid on top of the silt. Now, what they've done, they've covered the pipe with rocks to protect it. So it's like a reef, and the silverfish congregate near it, and the zander are always near those pipelines. Now there's two pipelines on the relief channel, two gas pipelines. I took them apart about 15 years ago. I was um, caught between 7 and 11 zander every day off those pipes, all over seven pound, all good fish. Had a hell of a time, and then um, then the fish just kind of moved on. Zander are funny like that. They could be there one day, and you come back a week or two later, and they could be ten miles away. They move as a whole pack. Um, <coughs> that is what was happening when I used to fish the relief channel, but. I came to realise that they'd run out of food. It also happened on the middle level. And if it ever happens on the trend, you guys will have the ball, but I can't see it happening. Um, <coughs> there was more predators than bait fish. And they were swimming up and down both the relief channel and the middle level, hungry. And you could just put out a whole big trout down the middle of the drain and wait, and the zander would come along in those days. Um, so when they get hungry and they start moving about, they become very easy to catch. And if you ever find a water that's got an imbalance like that, it's time to fish it before, uh, before things change. <coughs> Yeah, then. 
this is a swim where I was catching all my 14 pounds on the front. And I went back this year, and they've come, and they've, they've dredged it out, and they've flattened the banks, and re-scraped it, and cut the undergrowth down, and I couldn't even recognise it. So I had to get me rod and start leading, casting out, until I could find the rocks where I was uh, catching these big zander. And that's what I've coloured in there. That's how small an area we're talking about. That's where I've had five 14 pound zander from there, plus innumerable other double backup fish and two sea trout. Now, I've never, I'd love to dive down there and see actually what it is, but it could just be a, a reef, a big reef of rocks that, because um, when I caught two sea trout, it made me think sea trout must be like salmon, they, they lie up behind the big rock to, to rest from the flow. But um, anyway, this time I was with my pal and we'd, um, I caught three zander in the middle of the day by casting right on top of the rock. And um, then I turned around to my mate and said, come on, we're moving. Well, he's used to me, so I said, oh, bloody hell, here we go again. And we moved right up the other end of the channel to a bridge that I'd never fished at before. There was one area that I'd never fished. So I taught my mate into walking as far further than we've ever walked before from this bridge further up, just on a hunch. Anyway, he wasn't very happy with it, so I said, OK, instead of pushing your wheelbarrow, put your load on top of my wheelbarrow, we'll rope it up high, sheet it like a wagon, and I'll push the old bloody lot, and you just carry the rod bags. So, oh, hang on. that's um, just showing you more muscles and how the Silverfish like to play over it. So there we are, loaded up with a wheelbarrow. It was a lot higher than that this time, twice as high. And um, we pushed it as far as you can see and further. And my mate kept saying, Come on, stop here, stop here. I said, No, further, 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 further. I want to fish where nobody has ever fished before. Because these two bridges that we're walking between, it's the longest walk on the whole of the Relief Channel. And not many people can carry the tackle that far, or even push a wheelbarrow that far. So what I wanted to do was fish where no man had ever fished before, hoping that they find some virgin, undisturbed fish. And by God, we dropped right on them. Um, I think I had 21 fish. Um, yeah, that's a, a big old 12 pounder that I had. And uh, a 10. There was that many zander there, we were right on top of them, and you could just drop it under your rod tip and feel them plucking at it. But they weren't feeding, they were just mouthing it. And looking at it, but still catchable if you've got sensitive rigs. So, although sometimes Zander will pick the bait and swim off with it, a lot of times they won't. And when you get a pack of them that lay up like that, in between feeding time, they're not going looking for food, but they will take it. So it was, it was almost like ropes fishing, you could feel them pecking away at the bait. And I, uh, I broke my PB, 14 pounds, 6 ounces under. And um, so, as I turned around and said to my pal, it was worth the walk. And now when I, when I get hunched, he always thinks it's going to work out. But 99 times out of 100, they don't. I only tell you about the good ones. Anyway, I was, I was thrilled to bits with that. My second 14 pounds under. And um, 
We spent most of the rest of the season fishing up, up this way. People used to stop on the bridge about a mile and a half away and stare up at me. It was a bloody long walk to come and have a chat with me. So <coughs> People even phoned me up and uh, Stevie Gardner came down from Manchester with Gary Lee, walked up to Miss Swim and said, thanks but no thanks, too far from the pub mate. So um, they were there for a beer and I was there to catch the fish. Anyway, whatever you're into. Now, that's an out of focus, um, that's off one of my DVDs where I've, I've put music of Moonlight Sonata on. The point I put this up for is that I can remember standing in the relief channel in my waders, netting Xander at night, and the thing that sticks in my memory is the full moon every time. Great big full moon like that, and I can remember the, the silvery light reflecting back off the surface as I'm netting the fish. So <coughs> it's a fact that Xander fishing on a full moon is very good, because that's when I've caught most of my fish. And um, I also seem to catch a lot of big eels when it's a full moon as well. And other people don't agree with me, but I know what I read in my catch return, so I like my full moons. And um, when it gets rough, on the, which it inevitably does on the fence, because it's flat and you've got no shelter, I have to stick the wheelbarrow in front of the bivvy like that and I can still make a brew behind it and I can sneak out the side. So rather than turning my bivvy round when the wind <coughs> changes and blows into your doorway I just stick the, uh, stick the wheelbarrow up like that. There's a lot of uses my wheelbarrow. This next point is something I learned from Stevie Younger's book. Um, he tells you that if you find um, a pack of schoolies under, that somewhere not be far behind them are going to be some big old girls. So it's completely true, and I've followed that like. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's rung true for me many, many times. And here is a perfect example. Pete doesn't do much down the fishing. He's, he's my eel fishing partner. But now and again, he'll come down and, and do a bit of zedding. He's, um, I was on the fence for a week. He was working in London, and he dropped in on the way back for a couple of nights. Um, if you look at this weed bed here, it's the only weed bed for about two miles. So straight away you know you've got a good feature there. It goes out past the margins, so it's very shallow in here, this side of the weeds, but dropping the other side it's ten foot deep. Perfect spot for a pack of schoolies under to they, they work like cormorants do, when the, the cormorants work is teamwork and um, run the fish up the bank. You might have seen it. I, I've actually had cormorants run perch fry right up the bank when they're fishing and they're, they're leaping onto the bank to get away from the cormorants. Well, what the school is having to do here, they heard the silver fish against this bed of reeds and then the fish must turn back into them so they can grab them. So Pete turns up and I'm fishing on this weed bed. I can only fish one rod against it. And on that one rod, I caught 11 Zander. And when it went dark till a few hours later, one after another after another. Pete's got a friggin' heck. You know, you, you've got the swim and you're getting all the runs, you stuck me on a bummer. No, Pete. I explained Steve Younger's 
theory about the big zander following up the schoolie zander. Whether those schoolie zander have injured a few fish and maimed them and um, the big ones come along and find an easy meal or not, I don't know. But the fact is, find schoolie zander that are feeding hard, cast <coughs> all your other rods 50 yards away in each direction. So that's what I had Pete do. He put his rod out here and it was just um, a sandy bottom and barren and featureless. But this big old zander, which was his, his PB, um, mocked it up. It was so old, it, it didn't fight much and it keeled over. And Pete sat up all night holding it the root of its tail and it, it swam off strongly, I'm glad to say. But um, it was a very, very old fish, which um, goes to prove that the big old fish follow the schoolies under, which is um, a very, very good tip for big zander. It works on a seven as well, I've done it. And that reed bed, if you can find one of those on the relief channel, you're going to have some schoolies under. Because, like I said, there's, there's no reed bed there for a mile in either direction, so it's screaming out as a feature as soon as you spot it. Do you think it's possible that the bigger zander are after the school is? Or do you think it is a case they're just going for the easy meal? That's a good point. Hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know. No, these, these school is worth four or five pounds. Oh. be a bit big for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, it's something else. Yeah. The school is worth four, five, six, seven pounds. That's what I call a schoolie. So, um, yeah. There's a lot that we don't know, isn't there? But uh, we can just surmise. <coughs> now then, here's the best tip of the lot for the relief channel. Well, one of them. Um, some fen drains are pumped out by electricity. Other ones, they just lift the sluice gate and let gravity run it off once the tide's out in the wash. The relief channel is one that's run off by gravity. They shut the gate and they let it fill up and then when it's full, they open there's actually seven sluice gates at tail sluice. They can, they can open all seven, but we won't allow them anymore because it sweeps the fry away. So now they only open three or four or five generally, unless they have a major disaster. And um, the interesting thing is that when you get spring tide, they can't open the frigging gates because a spring tide is much bigger than the other tides and it comes right up to the gates and stays up there so long that they only can only open the gate for an hour or two and then they have to shut it again and this will go on for a few days at this biggest spring tide up. You mean the equinox storm? Yeah, that's right, this is October, yeah. I call it a springtime, but it is an equinox. This is somewhere around October the 13th, 14th, I think it varies slightly. So, this is the best catch of Zandra I ever had this day, by a mile. What happened, I woke up and I could hear lapping water. Well, when they run it off, this will drop down and I'll be able to walk out to there and stand on the bottom. That will be that will be um, just a sandy bottom. So this is deep here. It's about eight foot there. It, it goes off, and it's, it's actually filled up now. So I went to sleep and woke up in lapping water. The water was up here. It was lapping on the doorstep of my bivy. Now, if it goes any deeper, it's it's going to be a, a disaster and flood all the towns around there. So that is, once it lap in there, that's as far as they can go. They've got to let it go. 
So I woke up in my bed, heard this lapping water. All my rods were underwater. Couldn't get back. I could seven hours I thought. And those four are all doubles. I had a, a PB of 14, 14. I had a 12, 11, a 10. I think I had seven nines. I, I haven't got all the weights and written. I, I had so many eights. They were all big Zander. 21 massive Zander. Unheard of. That, that was the greatest catch ever down there. And I put it all down to this swirling water. It ended up, the, it was ripping through that much. I never even put a, um, I didn't put, use my drop off indicators or a bobbin. I was fishing it straight off the bait runner and it was only out a few minutes and it'd be gone again. It was, it was unbelievable stuff. So, for a few years after that, I was there every, every autumn equinox with, when you get the big spring tide. Um, it's worked a few times, to be honest with you. I've never had a catch like that since, but, uh, but my biggest trick for Captain Zander, the, here's your tail sluice. They lift the sluice up and let all the water run out to sea. When they decide to shut the sluice, bang, they just shut it. So all the water's <coughs> still got momentum heading for the sea. So it's all going to come and hit this sluice. It's still going that way. So what happens, it starts backing up round the edges. And you, that's, um, like I mentioned, when I first went to Fens, I couldn't work out why it used to flow in the wrong direction sometimes. And it's when they've just shut the gate, and it's backing up, the force still comes straight down the middle, and then it, it creeps back up the edges. Now, when they first shut this sluice gate, the relief channel is 11 miles long. <coughs> and you'll get waves hitting there and then rebounding back up to the other end. 11 miles all the way up and then hit the sluice at the other end and come back down. And it takes a couple of hours to settle down after they shut the gates after a big runoff. Now that is when you catch all the zander. Rather than in the runoff, it's best just after because the water's still coloured and still moving and they're madly on the feed. Now then, what I found was that if they've run the water off and then shut the gate, two days after the runoff, the water down the middle where these arrows are is still piling down the middle. Now, what we're going to come to when I get onto the seven is how Xander like flow. So, what I found was that you could see a crease. Where I put this squiggly line, that's the crease on the edge. <coughs> well, we're all experienced anglers and we all know that river fishing, certain species, you'll pick them up on that crease. Anyway, I found the zander were best right in the middle where the flow. It's still a strong flow. It pulled your indicator up, pulled your drop off off, but in the edge it's flowing the other way. And if you look right in the middle, you'll see you'll see the, the flow forcing its way down the middle. Again, the zander, because they like the flow, they concentrate into this little strip in the middle where the flow is. And that has caught me many zander. Just, um, and you can see it, like I said, you can see the flow pushing that way and just stick your bait there. That's where they are in the flow. Um, I guess that's one that caught from casting out into the flow in the middle. It's a very nice photo of Xander, that one. It's a pretty one bigger. I've never had one over £15, by the way, um, despite the fact that I've caught, I don't know how many double, I, I know I've, I've probably caught about 80 odd double figures under, but never had one over 15 so I've got all that to come, eh? It's a bit of luck. This was another repeat capture from the uh, 
from the relief channel this time. Caught an 11 pounder from a swim that I don't think anyone had ever fished. It took me about two, took me most of the day to cut the reeds down to, to fish there. Caught an 11, went back up eight days later, caught exactly the same fish from the same spot. So although I mentioned that the, the Zander tend to move around when they run out of bait fish, you find that most of the Zander I've caught are always in the same swim. Because um, it's not every year that they're short of food. And um, yeah, I've found that an awful lot, that to go back to the same swim and catch the same fish, which means they're not moving. But some years, when they were short of food, they would move. That was the only repeat capture of 14. Uh, that was the first time I caught it. Most of these I've caught with a tiny little bait. Um, like I said, I use strips of flesh more than I use whole baits these days. And I do think of I do think of Zander as being more like whiting. And they'll have a go at anything. So um, strips of flesh definitely worth a go. <laughs>